This week's podcast is sponsored by the Big Onion and Bootle Stand Shopping Centre, an initiative run by Merseyside Expanding Horizons. The Big Onion supports local businesses to return to the high street, as well as working with people wanting to start a business. In addition, the Big Onion runs projects to help people improve their skills and get back to work. To find out more, why not pop in? You'll love it. The Big Onion, a whole new high street experience. Hello everybody and welcome to the Billy Moore podcast and today's special guest is Michael Emmy, author of Sins of Our Fathers. How are you mate? I'm alright mate, how are you Billy? Brilliant, thanks for um, thanks for coming on. Oh no, it's my pleasure. Get a little bit to the mic and we'll get, get going. going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks for inviting me Bill. Yeah, so do us a favour, tell us a little bit about yourself so the, the audience gets to know who you are. Right, so a bit about myself was I come from a sort of a... Um, my father, really, he was a career criminal, so I was brought up in that environment. But um, and my mother was sort of a good old South London woman, a sort of, uh, sort of they were war ch- children, you know, they were sort of, my mum was into this booth on air style, full of eyelashes. Mm. And my dad was a sort of a, he was a villain, he was a, I wouldn't say, I don't like the word gangster, but he was well known in the fraternity of sort of, they call it the London underworld. He, um, he was a, uh, he was a strong man, he, he, he could fight. Emotionally, I used to find him quite weak. But, you know, on the streets of London, he had a little bit of a reputation. He was well thought of. But for my dad, I think he was, um, he had all the addictions, my father, but he was sort of ignorant to that because I think back in the day, it wasn't really known, you know? You just got on with it, you know, I'm a tough man, I'm this, weird, whatever he was. Uh, and I think he, from what he'd experienced, because he'd been married four times, and my mother was his second wife. He wanted a better, better, better life for his children. So he took us down to live in Surrey. And it was a bit of a contrast coming out of the flats. I loved the flats. I was born in the council flats in, in, in South London. And going to the Surrey in, like, in 1963, you know, it was like the Darling Buds of May. I don't know if you ever remember that series. Yeah, but it? that's what it felt like going down to Epsom and New Malden and going to school with kids who spoke nicely. I was a little Cockney kid. And so it was a bit of a, uh, bit, bit like being put in the plunge pool. And, and, and I found it a little bit difficult, to be honest with you. So, change? Yeah, change for me. I think I, I've struggled a, a, a lot of my life, well, my, all of my life, with addictions. Yeah. And, um, and like the obvious, the drug addictions and the alcohol, they're, they're the obvious. But for me, it's not about that. It's about, I think we're born with it. Yeah, and so that's that's something I've heard bandied about a few times. You know, over the years, you know, um, I was born and I used to like like going back many years ago when I first came into recovery and I listened to um, people share and they go, you know, I was born an addict and I was thinking, how do you know, mm. right? And then you look at the pattern, yeah. you know, the history of the family yeah. and how that went. So, what's your experience and, and how do you feel that you were born with this this addiction? Well, I suppose very early age, at a young age, there was sort of some sexual abuse around me, yeah. Uh, my parents never knew. Uh, and so that was sort of impregnated in me as a dysfunction. But my book is called Sins of Fathers because I, be- I really believe this, that the behaviour that my grandfather sort of played around with uh, and what my dad, it became apparent about my dad... I done things that my dad done without him even showing me. So he didn't show me about criminal life. He didn't show me about drug addictions. So I started to be at a very young age. I got disconnected. I, I was very rageful. Um, I think it had a lot to do. Some of it with the abuse, but I think it was in me. It was operating. I was never. I was at disease with myself. Uh, believe it or not, I was quite shy. Um, I started to sort of have conversations in my head. I was all, at a very young age. Uh, and as I grew into that sort of um, 11-year-old child, uh, then it even got worse for me. I, I found it hard to connect into reality. So there was always something going on where I had to fix myself. I started to be a naughty boy. So then I started to realise, looking back, that there was always the yin and yang, the high and low. I was looking to fix this hole that was inside of me. So I believe it's hereditary. Yeah, so you've got that vacuum, and it's um, 
you know, you're suffering with low self-esteem growing up yeah. and all the outside things yeah. seem to make, it's just to, to alleviate those yeah. those feelings. Yeah. I've, I've, I've experienced that kind of, uh, that similar yeah. and it's quite way of piece. growing up. Sorry, Bill. Sorry. I was saying I was experienced that similar way of growing up. I was just thinking about it then. It's just, um, there was always something missing. You know, that, they talk about that vacuum, don't they? And we need to fill it with something. Yeah. You know, if you get the best trainees that are out or the laces, you feel good to buy yourself, but only briefly. Absolutely. It never goes away. And it's an internal, it's an inside job. We, all, we know that, don't we? Absolutely. You know, that's that's yeah. what they talk about. It's, it is life is like uh, um, all about like what's inside and not outside. It was always, I was always looking for things on the outside of me to make me feel better. And then someone said to me one day, Bill, it's an inside job. Mm -hmm. You've got to... You know, you've got to find that humility, that love, that compassion, yeah. that understanding. Everything's got to come from within. Mm. And then you don't go without. Uh, oh, that's yeah. a lovely saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I totally agree with that. It's, uh, we can't, what, what's that saying? You know, uh, one's too many and a thousand not enough. Yeah. And I suppose from a young man not understanding that, uh, my sister was very bright at school. Um, I wasn't. My younger brother was very bright at school and yeah. I wasn't. Now, my dad was very bright, so whether they, that was, you know, what they got from my father. Mm. My mother was sort of, she was, uh, uh, my mother was a funny lady. She, she had a great sense of humour. She, she wasn't bright academically, but it, she had sort of a, uh, an understanding of people's values. Uh, she was for the underdog. She was always, leave him alone, and always like the naughty boys. It was like as if she sort of uh, embraced the naughtiness of her son. And I think she must have had a watchful eye on me, because I think my mum early days spotted that I walked with a limp sort of thing. Mm. There, were, there was sort of damage that she couldn't quite put her finger on it. And her brother, one of her brothers, God rest his soul, was a beautiful man, but he was a schizophrenic. Yeah. Uh, and I think she had fears that that might be upon me. Um, which it never was. And I've now, as I've got older and I've researched this and I've worked my program and I've, I've tried to change the, who I am, then I started to realise that this stuff inside of me, yeah, needed, to, like you say, it's an in jo inside job. It needed to be loved, it needed to be nurtured, but through the ignorance of not understanding addiction at a very young age, a very young age, I'm talking about a very young age, I disconnected. Mm. And I was living in this Michael's world, in this little dream world that um, I was always trying to impress. I was always trying to be good at something. But there was a little voice in me that I, I realised today was a voice that's saying, you're no good. Mm. You ain't got what it takes. And so I was always trying to overcompensate that emotion. Yeah. I think, I think there's, 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 there's plenty of people out there who have that, that voice mm. that comes from Mm. It's, it's, it talks to them in their own voice, yeah. tells them that they're not worthy, they're not good, mm. they're not good enough, they're not going to amount to anything. I heard it most of my life, yeah. you know, so it's um, it's a struggle. Yeah. It was a struggle growing up. Very much so. And it, it seems that we've had a, a similar path. Mm. What led you down to um, the path of crime, do you think? Well, it was funny because Brian, my father... He, he, he had another son, uh, he was called Brian too, they call him Little Brian. So he was a bank robber, yeah? So my dad didn't influence that, but it was it was the fraternity of the people that he grew up in. But with me, I know my dad was adamant about mm. keeping me away. And um, for the goodness of a, 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 of a future life, so he thought it was an outside job, send him to a nice school, mm. dress him with nice clothes, educate him, which is a lovely thing. But, but, but for, for, for me, as a very young age, I started stealing to his astonishment when I was about 11. So I was looking for that, that high and low then, and, and I wanted to impress the girls. So I used to go into Walworths. It was like, we weren't a village, but back in the day in Surrey, in New Malden, it was very quiet. So Walworths, it wasn't like London. And I'd go in there and I'd nick all like uh, mascaras and lipsticks for the girls to show off. I sort of like kissing girls at a very young age. Yeah. I was, it was quite dysfunctional. And then all of a sudden, I had my first taste of booze when I was about 11. Yeah. But my mum and dad always had drink in the house because my dad was like a sort of a, he was a clubber. He weren't like Peter Stringfella, but he had like a drinking club in Ballam when we was younger. So there was always booze in the house. But the first time I think I started to turn to crime was, I think it was an addiction. I, I liked the high of it, the low of it. Uh, and then I started getting into fights. And, and to my dad's dismay, you know, he was adamant that I weren't going to do it. But as a young man, 
I remember as a very young man seeing my dad have one violent fight in the street, which frightened the life out of me. And I know he didn't mean it, uh, but there was a bit of trouble. He parked me round the corner, had a yeah. fight with a guy in the street. The guy come running round the corner after my dad had sort of done some damage. And as you know, sod's law. Ye years ago, the cars, where the wheel was inside, it's not like it is today. You could sit on top of it. It was like a wheel arch inside the car. It was an old Jaguar, I think. And I remember sitting near the little corner uh, 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 um, uh, window and the geezer's come running around the corner, tripped, and he's fell against the car right where I was sitting, sod's law. And his face was there. I was only a kid, but I, it traumatised me. Oh, yeah, definitely. Badly traumatised me. My dad come running around the corner, went to have another... I screamed... You know, I know it's how do I remember these things. I've spoken to, to about my dad as I was growing up. And it was a, something that really laid, impregnated me. And it frightened the life out of me. Mm. And my dad got quite emotional, picked me up. I was crying. Dad, daddy got emotional. And I think that had an influence as well. And then growing up, um, meeting my dad's friends, not knowing who they were, but then seeing them in the newspapers. Mm. And, and so the subconscious mind started to realise that we was living a lie. So who were your dad's friends that you'd, yeah. you'd recognised? Well, my dad was uh, associated back in the day with people like, grew up with people like Freddie Foreman. Mm. Um, I met Eddie Richardson at a very young age. Um, there was other guys who, who I won't mention on this podcast because mm. they would get, then they've not been sort of put out there in the way a lot of people are, but there was, I knew that there was a, with the train. So the London, the London Underground, the fraternity. Very much so. So the, them, they're, not, they're well known faces that we all know. Yeah, Frankie you Fraser's. Don't, yeah. I met them all as a young man. Yeah. And so then you start to realise, and yeah. Did they, did they have an impression upon you? Did you, did you feel like that you wanted to be? Because I remember reading books when I was away, right? And I always wanted to be this character <laughs> in this book, yeah. right? Charlie Bronson, okay, I'll be him. I'll, I'll bend prison doors. I'll climb on prison <laughs> roofs. You know, I, I believed it to be yeah, true. Sure, right. And I think sometimes when you read these books and you go into the fantasy of it all, mm. because that's what we do. You, you talked about it before, you know, you lived in a fantasy world. Yeah. You were trying to impress a lot of people and, yeah. and do a lot of things that, you know, just to make yourself feel good Absolutely. about who you were. Yeah. And for me, it was all about reading books and being somebody else. Yeah. Always believed that, you know, I always thought I was adopted, yeah. you know, and that my family were millionaires, <laughs> you know, and I, I always like used to look for flaws in my own really, family. I don't really laugh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, don't yeah I used to all look for flaws in my family. Think oh, I'm definitely different. Yeah, yeah. You know, I am. I've been picked up. At the, <laughs> that was the wrong one. And you know, we, you go into all this yeah. stuff because you don't understand reality. Yeah, you don't understand reality. You don't feel like you you, you fit into society and, yeah. and and be a part of like. Yeah. I used to look at my own family from outside and think I don't even belong inside. Right. It was just strange. Yeah. No. And, and and you're you know the similar I think that's with the addiction side of things like my sure. brother had friends right I couldn't get a friend you know I couldn't have fucking I, I didn't know how to to, 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 to to relate to anyone right. no one was knocking at the door for me to go out right. you know so I always felt jealous and envious why do you think that was I don't know I, I, I felt I, well I do know now I, it was because I was I was so insecure yeah I had low self esteem yeah I was embarrassed at the way my dad was behaving and acting, right. you know, because he was, um, you know, because he was drinking a lot, right. and it was he, uh, to me, it, it, you know, it brought shame upon, yeah. you know, I couldn't bring a friend now with my dad doing that, kicking right. off, and you know, he's battered me in front of people, yeah. you know, when I was a young kid. So you know, if you meet girls, you don't want to get beat up by your dad, right, for sure. you know. So th th I think that was the reason. So I isolated myself and I separated myself, and it was really lonely. Yeah. And um, at a very young age, bro. At a very, very young age, it really was. It was. Um, when did you pick up? When did you? When did you start using? I'd say it was. I must have been about nine, ten, and I was stealing some Aussie pan out of my auntie's handbag. What taking them? Yeah, just taking. Like they used to get these uh, little yellow twenties oh, and know, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the capsules, the eggs. Yeah, I remember. And eat, they were eat, green ones. Eat, yeah, they? used to eat the, the yellow ones and get a little wobble off them. And really? Yeah, they enjoyed the feeling. Yeah, no, I understand that. I did, I, and people say they took drugs to change the way they felt. I, I think I took them. Out of curiosity, they were there, and I liked the way they made me feel then. Yeah, me too. And then I moved and progressed to other things. Right. So yeah, that was um, my experience was quite early. Right. However, I didn't take that drug and then become immediately addicted to something else. I kind of went through a bit of a life. Yeah. And then I was at the age of sixteen, where I snowballed 
heavily then. Where was that? In Liverpool? Yeah, it was, yeah, Liverpool, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because when, with the knowledge that I have today, it doesn't make it any easier. It just makes it easier to, 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 to deal with. So I, my heart breaks to think that my dad didn't understand. Yeah. yeah. And um, Shame, yeah. Yeah, it breaks my heart, nor my grandfather. Yeah. And so they lived in this torment without understanding that there was a way out. Yeah. Uh, my dad searched towards the end of his life. But I think when I look back on it, and I think like when I first got drunk, when I was 11, now my mum and dad used to have optics, old fashioned little bar, and when there was a party in my house when we lived in the flats, I can remember finding my mum's gin and tonic. I'd get a, a, bit, of lipstick, a bit of lipstick, the, the smelly ashtray. I used yeah. to love it. But I remember drinking my mum's gin and tonic and liking how warm it used to make me feel. And I was mm. only six or seven. I never, I never used to, do, to get drunk with it, but I'd go to my sister Karen, oh, and we, because it was mummy's glass. Mm. But there was a sensation here. The, 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 even at a young age, I, I didn't put, I didn't equate it then, but I liked the way it used to make me feel. And then I mm. remember getting drunk on a party. Remember them party fours? Mm. It was like, you'd get four pints of lager in one tin. And I remember me and my mates, we was in the mall, I was about 11 and I got plastered. Uh, and so it went on from there. And then I realized that I was always constantly trying to impress, like we just said a minute ago, and, and, and it's quite frightening when you look back, but we're resilient kids. You know, kids are so resilient. And so that's why I have a compassion for children that they yeah. struggling. But it's funny how it takes off and, uh, and what, it, what it means and, and how life-changing it can be and how tough we are. Mm. We're a mixture of an opposite, I believe, us addicts. Mm. Very tough, very weak. And so before I knew it, the, the mental illness, I, I couldn't concentrate in school. And before I knew it, I was I, I got on this merry-go-round of constant fixing myself because I couldn't sit quietly with Michael. I mean, it's sad, really, mm. when I think about it. And be at peace and, and just be a lovely young boy, which we would love to be as a child. Uh, and then the influence of Dad. And then before I knew it, I, I, I was just off for, for many years at it. You know. It's, it's you know what I was thinking of a song then like, let the children let the children's laughter remind us of how song. of how it used to be. I love this. She you know when I, I see my little boy and he's laughing and he's giggling and I think how oh, innocent and how beautiful oh. is it, mm. um, and and I feel was I ever like that? And I always ask my mum questions. Yeah. You know did my dad ever, you know, yeah. treat me the way I treat my son or and she, she's she's old school. I think they live they come from a generation of like, you know. Parents who were, who were who were in the war, yeah, that's children of the war, and that's what it was. you know there was a, there was a lot of austerity, yeah, very um, much so, and very closed off. Yeah, very Intimacy much. Intimacy was lacking in in, yeah. in areas. Now there's a little there's a, there's a lot more love, mm. and because you know, we've learned, mm. because we've missed it growing up, yeah. and we know what it's like not to receive it. I agree. So what we do is we give it to the people that need it. Absolutely. And that's the change going forward. I feel yeah. like, you know, Michael. It's true, though. Yeah. God, you've brought a tear to my eye, Bill. That's very true. And I'm Michael, you're Billy, but the addict is, it operates in, in, it's cunning and baffling. But I think when we accept the fact what we may have missed, yeah. and we're now we're changing the inside job, thank God that you went through that misery for the sake of your son mm. so he doesn't and I'm not thank God you went through it but what a learning because we break the curse I believe uh, sins of fathers yeah. the, the Bible and I don't want to get religious on you it talks about the, the ancestral sin yeah the sins of the forefathers your dad drinking a lot you drinking a lot and by the way I, I, I'm a, I loved your life I loved your film loved your book and not because you've made a film and made a book, because what I loved about it was that poignant moment when you said, this is it, uh, when you was running down the track, in wherever it was in Thailand. Uh, and there's that moment that you decided, no more, no matter what, you've beaten yourself up like I have. Yeah. And I think that revelation of breaking that, um, that call it a sin, call it addiction, call it whatever you like, so your son, Sean, is his name? Uh, Albie. Sorry, Albie, so sorry. So he doesn't, if, if he is impregnated with it, he can have the tools, he can have the love, 
he can have, and pray God he's not, but you, you, you're now equipped to make your son's life so much nicer. So your son's son, son, sons mm. will, must, will be very grateful for the turnaround in your life. Yeah, for the, for the, Amen for the, that. Yeah, for the experience that you yeah. went through. Amen that. It's, it's benefiting the future Absolutely. of your legacy. And I, yeah, so... Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, yeah. It made, it made perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. It made a lot. Um, You've got a nice way about you, Bill. Thank you. A very thank you. peaceful... Way. It was. It was never always no. that way. Oh, no, it, uh, it was a. It was very volatile. And see, so yeah, I. See, I still get it. You know, some days. You know, and it's like. The rage. Could, yeah, you, you know, it's like it's inside. It never goes away. No. No matter how much yeah. you try and you, you try and bury it, you, you know, you can act spiritual. You can. You, you can. You can be holier than thou. But the reality is, you know, when you're driving that car and or, 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 or there's someone mm. in your way or in your face and, and it comes up. Mm. I have to push. I have to push that down. Mm. You know, that feeling. Mm. I just bite my tongue and I just walk away. Yeah, right. Because it's not that I'm scared of them. It's I'm scared of myself mm. and how I will react. Yeah. And then there's a consequence. Absolutely. So I'm grateful that I've got that awareness. Amen. I that's, agree. That's, Absolutely. That's, that's that's what I've learned. I've that's got this gift. I've got that awareness where I can take that breath and that breath separates the men from the boys. Yeah. Where you go. Mm. Make that decision. Beautiful. Play the tape forward. Yeah. Where's this going to take you? Yeah. And you can do that in a split second. No, absolutely. You've got to practice it. Yeah, you know? you've got to practice it. Yeah. You know, it hasn't, um, it hasn't come easy. Do you think it's shame-based? Yes. Yeah. yeah been, I lived in shame shit. Isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. It is. You know, Worst lived, drug in the world, shame. Yeah. You it's know, and I've, heard, um, I've heard a few, I've heard a few good shares on, on shame and, you know, how to deal with it. Mm. How do you deal with it? How do I deal with it? I suppose it, it, it's a daily sort of uh, conquest. But I think if I'm abstinent from the consequence of shame, i.e. if I don't react, who does he think he is? Who's he looking at? I'm 63 years of age. and I've still got the bad end. I can't have a fight, but, but I still think I'm a tear <laughs> away. So if I don't... If I, what you just said, the analogy of what you said is, is the perfect uh, addict's way of being free mm. from not the drugs, but the behaviour, yeah? So if we deal with shame in that way, then we get better at it. And it ain't toxic, and then it don't have a voice. So I think in all areas of my life, be it greed, control, lust, um, responding to shame, low self-worth, so I, I think what it is, it's being abstinence from allowing the consequences to make the emotion worse. So if I lash out in shame or whatever, then the consequence gets worse and worse and worse. The shame bubble's available. But if I say no, and it's difficult, yeah, especially in relationships with women, I struggle badly. Who do you think you are? That sort of syndrome, don't you know? And it's only my broken child getting better. So how do I shame, uh, deal with it in a nutshell is I become abstinence mm. from what it wants to be. And, and I can't be that person and then the following day like myself. And I need to like myself or be kind to myself so I can be kind to you, my next door neighbour, my children. But my, my, one of the most blessed situations that has helped my recovery or helped me love myself and my grandchildren, yeah, mm. because I wasn't available for my children. As much as my heart was, I, I love kids. I mean, mm. when I got arrested, Bill, I got arrested at gunpoint, and and the, and the, and the, and the cousin said to me, "A penny for your thoughts," mm. and that's not an ego shout, the gun, the gun, but that's my reality. And I said, "My three children." And I was this big, boisterous criminal, rah, rah, screaming and shouting. And when he said, "A penny for your thoughts," I said, "My children, my three children," and I started to weep. And I'm sitting on the floor in North Devon with a boatload of cannabis. And all I couldn't think about was my three kids. And I could, I never, I adored them. But my nutty head, I was either having sex with another woman, sadly. Mm. I was taking drugs or I was at crime. And my grandchildren have broken my heart for the purpose of good. So I've got a heart language now. Uh, and my grandchildren have been a major part in me establishing love for myself. Brilliant. Really Brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, that's that's a, just a nice place to put it. Because you're not the man you was 
sitting before me today back then because you spent a long time in prison. Mm. Your life, yeah, we'll, we'll touch on this now, is uh, was one of like international drug smuggling. Yeah. You know, how did that come about? What what happened there? You know, where was it? What was you doing? How much was you bringing in? We'll only keep to what I was arrested for. Okay. That's cool. So, That's cool. No, uh, we're not going <laughs> to... <laughs> so, um, so I, I suppose the progression was this, that, that I, I think in the sort of 80s, it seemed to me that when criminals get involved with a certain crime uh, and they get away with things like uh, fraud or bank robberies or whatever's the flavour of the time, then the police get involved... Uh, and then they hire the sentences and, and then all of a sudden so the criminals change to a different sort of way of getting money mm. so at that particular time in the 80s um, I, 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 I know drugs were available but not to the extreme of what what. and I don't, I just, I don't want to tell tales about drug dealing or anything like that but cannabis then was sort of the new kid on the block mm. and my dad and, and I wouldn't be speaking about this, Bill, if they was alive, but it was my dad and a guy called Joe Parle, yeah? And uh, and there was another guy who, who since passed away who was Joe's good friend, a guy called Alex Steen. And and they was, you know, they used to do all sorts of things. And, and Alex was a, 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 a ticket promoter with the boxing in, in the West End. So there was all that going on and they had connections out in America. Uh, Joe was connected through Alex for, for, through the five families out there real stuff real stuff uh, and my dad was out there with Joe and, uh, and my dad was an handful you know he wasn't um, he, he was an handful my dad so he was a little bit of like uh, uh, but he was likeable lovable rogue uh, they were both very game they were both very clever so I'm not saying it it's, it come out of that uh, Italian mob but there was Italians involved in Europe they're all dead, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it, trust me. And they started to do a cannabis run into the UK in the 80s. Mm. And I was a young kid. All my mates were doing apprenticeship, plumbing jobs and driving jobs and all that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, I, and I got um, drawn in to seeing bags of money. Um, I, start, I was using myself at the time. And I think my dad started to realise, because I've been nicked, I've been into Brixton prison for handling stolen goods, that I think reluctantly... He opened a small door for me. So I started to get on the tail end of what they was doing. It weren't drugs to them, it was a commodity. It was something that you smuggled. It was against the law. So there's the excitement there because they didn't know anything different. Well, they did. They were clever business people, but there was a profit at the end of the day. So they weren't drug takers, my dad and Joe. And so I got onto that and I got a flavour for it. Uh, and before you knew it, I started doing my own bits and pieces. Um, I was in a heavy, heavy duty chase by police. I was with a guy who was, who was badly wanted. Uh, we got smashed to pieces in a car crash. Um, I got judged in chambers because they couldn't find the evidence at the time. They found it later because it was concealed in a car and it smashed to pieces, this motor. And back in the day, if you was wanted by the police, you went down to Marbella. So I went down to Marbella. Uh, this is in 83, 84. And it was like my bayer. There was, was, and he was, a, he's a lovely man, Freddie Foreman. So Fred's there, the, the, the Ronnie Knight, and I'm not name dropping. It's just, you know, it, 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 the, the people you met. Yeah, they were there, but they was influenced. Yeah. And then my dad had a bit of influence with Joe, so there was a little thing that they found for me to do, and I was getting a couple of quid, messing about, being naughty. But something very tragic happened to me down there in 1985. My uh, my younger brother, who was I would dis. I would, I would describe, and it's not perfection in, in, in life, in materialism or, or being correct. He, he, he was perfection in love. This kid was a love ball. Beautiful, beautiful boy. I, I have a privilege to call him my brother. Uh, and my grandfather was dying, my mother's father. So he'd come down to Spain. Uh, a couple of times to visit me, we'd had a few little fights. Do you remember the fight at Eddie Ayoff? No, no. It was a, we'd had a fight with him, so it, 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 it fought Bob Foster for the eliminated for the light for light heavyweight championship of the world. So he, he was useful. We had a fight with him. It got a little bit notorious down here, and all that. And they don't want it because they're they're wanted, and they want the police away from them. So I made a bit of a noise, negative noise for myself. But it was an arm down there because I knew me dad. 
And then one day we all went out and, and we got stoned and we was taking drugs. And my brother wasn't really a big drug user. We had an argument about my father because my dad had, had met another woman and he, and he fell in love with another woman and he was leaving my mother. So we was talking about that. We had an argument. I gave him the car keys. I won't go into it any much longer. He drove to Malaga Airport. On the way back, he went underneath the lorry and it killed him stone dead. Yeah. So oh. that was... It, that was just... But what they'd done, he exploded the hole. Oh, my God. I cried out to God, what have you done? And when I say it was nasty, it, it was nasty. He was in a terrible state, the kid. Uh, I had to go and get his body and get him home. I was wanted by the police. Uh, two days later, my grandfather died, so my mother buried her son and, and her dad on the same day. I came home. I had to be at his funeral. And his girlfriend was six months pregnant. He never met his son. He was a beautiful boy today. Charles, the most incredible. My brother would be so proud of him. My, my brother would be a grandfather today. So it was... It, I, I, and I felt I'd lost the prize of the family. You know, he was the prize. He, he, he was undisturbed. He, he had an equilibrium about him that was very special. He'd be, he'd be sitting here now and you, 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 you and he weren't flash. He was a funny boy, lovely boy. So that, that hurt me, you know, like it hurt anybody. Uh, when his son was born, they said it created the shame. I've killed his dad, what have I done? And so I just went on to, I, when I come home, I got arrested, went to prison, and then I went on a trail of destruction. I got on the ecstasy tablets. Uh, I was using copious amount of drugs. I had an affair. Uh, sadly, I went out of a girl, my wife's best friend, and I was in it badly. I was in it badly. And all I was trying to do was saying, look at me, I'm in pain. You know, what, what's happened to me? Why me? Why me, brother? And it was so big, this pain. But I hid it for many years because I, I was a smart kid. I had a few quid, I had the cars and all that. Uh, and then I, I had a bit of an emotional breakdown. Uh, I'd been to prison, come out, had the affair. Um, and then I went back down to Spain in the... Um, in the, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, and, and through my dad's connections, got bang at it and started smuggling and, uh, you know, in a sort of a big way. Uh, and the connections I had with my dad, uh, and it was still sort of young, the cannabis game was still young. Mm. And like I say, Bill, I, I won't be talking about it if I ain't got mm. Nick for it, or, or, but, I, but I did. So it became very exciting. It sounds like... Losing your brother was the straw that broke the camel's back. Very much so. In a sense of like, you know, the fuckets came in. Now that was a, Amen. you know, quite a, a story of trauma and, mm. and, and what you went through and your family and your mother mm. as well. Yeah. Having to bury not only a dad, but a son on the yeah. same day. Absolutely. You're on the run. Powerful stuff. Yeah, you know, it is powerful. Yeah. Wow. But it comes with, a, that's the consequences, isn't it? It is, yeah. It yeah. certainly is. I mean, there was plenty of consequences throughout my life yeah. um, and I was accountable mm. you know I couldn't justify or minimize mm. the reality of it it was it was there because I was doing it mm. you know you can easily blame mm. I was easy, you know I was quick to blame growing up yeah. on, uh, in poverty yeah. uh, I was quick to blame getting picked on in school by kids Look, cause, cause all this had an impact on, on how, how I went through life it was the contributing factors for sure that affected me okay you know i don't even i don't know whether if it, if it was brought up in in, in the countryside that you know i'd have probably been a village drunk you know i'd have been i'd have been using something i get it you know and I, what what drugs did you end up like and did did you did you get addicted to what was your you go to drug uh I'm not against cannabis, yeah, yeah, but I'm not here to say like legalize it or anything like that, and I'm not saying it's wrong or right. So my my cannabis smoking was something that I enjoyed, yeah. See, I enjoyed a puff in the morning, yeah. in the afternoon. So that was primarily, pr primarily my, my my choice of drugs, but to to go to the explosion and go to the wanting and the getting and I want more and I'm going to be like this and I, it was cocaine. Mm. So I, I, I'm, 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 after Martin died, it was like I had a grow bag, an horse's grow bag, I constantly like cocaine around my face, up my nose, because I was selling it, I, I, could, I had access to it. But I became a liability. I became a liability and I knew that. Not a liability that I would ever tell tales, but uh, you know, I weren't on time. 
I, I wasn't available. I'd be up till five or six o'clock in the morning. So I, I, I wasn't available to do what I should be doing. And it's okay doing, and I'm not looking at sort of levels of criminality, but because this was a lot, an organised crime situation, you had to be on point. Uh, my dad and Joe got nicked at the end of the 80s. They got out of that, quite rightly so. And, and so there was a big breakup with my dad and Joe. They both went their own ways. Uh, Joe, Joe went to prison, he got 14 years. And my dad said, listen, there's a chance here. So, so I had to get clean. But I got clean, I was an abstinence from it. Yeah. But I knew that if I was at graft and I was gonna be nicked, I had to take responsibility. So when I went out to Spain, half broken again the second time, I sort of put, not the, I, I didn't put the cannabis down but I was using it to medicate in a way. And then I started to get strong again. I was in the sun. I met another lady, a nice young lady, Italian lady, and, and they're very mumsy. So I, 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 I got a home. So my home life became settled. Mm. And I responded to that, you know, and, and I kept away from the cocaine and I took work very, very seriously. But that became my addiction. Getting the money, doing the crime. I mean, it's very exciting as well, don't get me wrong. And, um, but extremists, aren't we? Oh, <laughs> I, I always say, I, I, I saw pleasure, you know, in um, extremism. Yeah. You know, doing things that were pushing the boundaries Absolutely. always. Did you ever come across Howard Marks? Yeah, cool. Mr. Mr. Nice? Yeah, I, we knew Howard. Did you know Howard, yeah? Yeah, Howard, Howard, was a, Howard was a friend of Joe's and Brian's. So I met Howard. Later on, I, I knew his partner's wife quite well as well. Mm. I still sometimes see her. But I, Al was, wasn't a friend, but he was an associate. And um, he was he was close to Joe and my father. Yeah. And he was a special man. I, I used to like... Uh, I, I was When I was going to Joe Pyle's funeral, I got off the tube at Malden and, and Al was there and we got in the cab together. And even then, the eloquence of Al, he spoke wonderful voice. Uh, and there was just a p something about him, he was very intelligent, very funny, uh, and, and there was a warmness about him. There was not an arrogance or like, oh, I'm Howard Marks. That, that didn't exist. No, yeah, yeah. He was sort of, did you, did you meet Howard? No, but I read, I read his book uh, years ago when I was yeah. a young offender, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I was fascinated yeah, yeah, yeah. with the, the way he used to change his identity. Yeah. And, Clever you know, because there was a lot of, growing up, I was influenced by books, mm. and I felt, when I was writing my own, I didn't want to invent a big glamorous lifestyle no. to entice young people into going down that road. Mm. I had to, it was dark, Absolutely. it was devastating, it was one of destruction, austerity, barbaric, you know, and it was a place that you don't want to go. And people go, well, you've had a book and you've had a movie. Look, mm. if I could turn back to the clock now Absolutely. and just go, look, I'd rather, you know, take a little, another route than I would. Me too. You know, because I, I, I going through all that, there's consequences going forward mm. physically. Yeah. You know, I might look on the outside okay, but mm. you know, the, physically there's, the, there's, there's, I'm broken in other areas. Yeah. Mentally, yeah. you know, my mind's fractured. Yeah. I think the only way I go through it is like by giving back. Mm. I give back to, to society and the community. If I don't give back, then I take. Absolutely. And I'm on the take, and I'm on the take, and I'm on the take, and it's. Um, it doesn't make me feel good. They end up in places that I don't want to be. What's that saying? We only keep what we got by giving it away. Yeah, and that's—I believe that to be true. And in in a sense, it's like, well, see, and that's for people who don't understand what we're talking about. Like, we only keep what we we, we have by giving it away. It's like people freely give us yeah. guidance, awareness, understanding, information, mm -hmm. time, love, compassion, understanding. We were given that freely. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have to pay for it. We didn't have to go to a therapist and go, "Yeah, yeah mate, it is. absolutely." You know, six hundred pound an hour. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, to talk about how you feel because that's what people do, and they, they can go there for months and years, and uh, but we can go to a place uh, and we can get that freely. Absolutely. So when we see, Excuse me. you know this, Michael. When we see uh, people who have who are suffering, whether they're on the streets or whether, <coughs> excuse me, they'll, they, they, you know, if they've got money in the back pocket, it doesn't matter. It doesn't addiction doesn't separate. No. It doesn't go. Okay, he's got money, and he's homeless. So. We'll separate the uh, because the illness, and I'll call it an illness, is centered in our thinking, and it's centered in my thinking anyway. Mind. It's centered, it's set between the shoulders, and it's absolutely it's constant. Now, Don, yeah, that's where it is. It operates right in that mindset, doesn't it? Yeah, 
And I think that's what we need to work on. I just wanted to ask you a question yeah. as I was sitting here talking to you, because I find you, you got my story, you know, just different places, different things. Mm. And I had that sort of when you said, I want to be like them. Yeah. Although I wouldn't admit it, because admit it, that wasn't my heart, but in the back of my head was like, yeah, yeah, like Frankie mm. Frey, yeah. whatever that was. And uh, Pretty boy short, all old yeah, stories. Absolutely, said, yeah. yeah. We knew Roy and, yeah. and, and certain things and... Uh, yeah, all that stuff. But one of the things I, what just touched me, I was just as you was talking, I, I saw your film, and uh, and I've told you before, uh, and we've only really just met. Uh, but f forget the glamour and beauty of the, of the production, because I thought you made it extremely well. But I followed your story through the eyes of my addict, yeah, through the eyes of my compassion, through the eyes of my God. And, and I looked at you in that film only because I know about myself and other addicts what you had to go through. Thank God for your addicts. Although it's destructive, it also gives you strength to do it. But I found in moments that you spent in that prison really powerful. And I thought, my God. Not, oh, he's a tough boy, which you might be, but what you was going through. And we're creatures of habit. We can extend to anything, especially us addicts. There's a power in us that once we have to do it, albeit destructive, the chaos is pretty tough to cope with if you're not an addict, yeah? And I, them moments in them prisons when I was watching you, I thought, my God, you know, what has this guy gone through? So it ticked the box, not because you made a film when you was in a prison in Thailand or wherever you were. Was it Thailand? It yeah, you? yeah. It ticked the box that this guy is getting into recovery to change his life. So there's admiration for the mere fact that you've had enough. You've hit your rock bottom. And it was a bit of a rock bottom, Bill, wasn't it? Yeah. But what a courageous thing for you to do. Because yeah. otherwise we can take our own life, can't we, Bill? We can. And, you know, you talk about rock bottoms, but I've heard it says, and I believe it to be true, that some rock bottoms have trap doors. We can, we can hit a rock bottom, and then boom, there's a trap door, and we're hitting more rock bottoms. So I, I kept on writing. Uh, you know when you go this is it yeah. rock bottom can't go any further than yeah, this yeah, and then yeah. you go lower yeah, yeah. and you're lower and you you think you know what's next yes. there's only death yeah, there's only death next yeah. you know and um, so true so to change and it, I, I like see this is this is good that we can talk about this stuff okay there's a lot of uh, criminality and, and people love drama and, and, and they love all that yeah. that kind of stuff and some people don't mm. that's, that's okay mm. But what I like is is the fact that we can redeem ourselves, yeah. right? And no, and I said this on a few podcasts. It's not about like, oh, they're not making money no more, so they're doing this and they want to do that. And it's not about that. It's like it. it I think you grow up. Mm. Amen. You grow up. You wake up. You want to share your knowledge to the youth of today. That's correct. And just allow them, because I never had someone coming to my school. No, absolutely. Did you? No. No one came in. No, look, no. So no one came in my school when I was younger. Went right. This is what I've done, mm. and this is the way I've lived. Mm. And how do you, what do you think about that? None, none of that. No, not at all. I, well, we just had assemblies and we shone games, and that's it. Absolutely, you know? same for me. Yeah, same so for me. It's. I think it's interesting. Even if you can reach out and just help that one person, that one child, and that one, you can go. Do you know what? Thanks, mate. You know. Um, it. It. it I, I'm thinking differently about what I do. That's it. Yeah. I just just the fact that the people think differently. Mm. I think the concept of excitement, I if we don't understand how unwell we are, yeah. we, we only look for the bad things in life. That's why things like the chocolate will have you, so taste so nice. Mm. It's like the apple in, in the Bible. Don't eat, I'm, I'm not getting religious, don't eat the apple. It looks beautiful, right? But uh, So we, that, that, that quest for excitement... But the value of excitement that I get today, I, I would shift it away f to, uh, and call it joy. The, uh, the, the joyfulness that I have today in helping another addict uh, and the benefits I get from it is it helps me. Uh, and I've got the big crime story. I'm not showing off, I have. It just happens to be it. And that was excitement, but to a level of dysfunction. There was always a flip side to that. Now, the boys I work with, mentor a couple of boys that joyfulness of seeing them get on their life always exists i don't get a yin and a yang and a high and a low from it mm. i think oh terrific and you haven't got an agenda no you're not doing it for a bouquet of flowers no no and that's that's what's important it's like there's no shelf seeking no yeah and it's um 
it's all about like being of service. Absolutely. Which is important. So I, I, I feel I feel it's a, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali says and it we're placed on this earth to be of service to other people. Mm. Which is true. Absolutely. If you go through life just taking and, and, and being selfish and self centered and thinking about me and oh, oh you know, woe be me, it, it, it you're gonna have a, a sad kind of <laughs> ending. And I've got a friend who always says, Look, we need to finish life strong. We need to finish it strong. And we need to finish it positive. Because we're not here forever, I mean, and while we're here, you know, it's about making a, a difference. I, I always say this, I've been, you know, I take responsibility for my actions, you and, and you know, I was, um, like, I was a drag to society, I was a drain mm. on my family, you know, I was um, always in the prison system, and, you know, it was just that merry-go-round of, like, mm. of prisons, institutions, and, you know, almost dying. Uh, to actually having the opportunity, and this is incredible, to have a platform mm. to talk about uh, the positive outcomes that we can promote. Absolutely. You know, you've written a book, Sins of Our Fathers. You've had to go through a, an experience. You haven't written this because, you know, you're trying to make it, because you know as well as me, Michael, making writing books doesn't make you any money. It's quite difficult, you know what I mean? Um, so it's not, it's not a money thing. It's a message. It's just a message, yeah, because this is a legacy that you're leaving behind for your grandkids. Absolutely, amen. You know, and they can go like this, my uncle or yeah, uh, yeah. my uncle or yeah, my granddad, yeah. and, yeah. you know, Michael. Um, so that's important. It's, 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 it is a message. Absolutely. You know. And, um, Do you know what I think? In, in, um, so people might think, oh, they're trying to earn money or whatever they're doing out of it. But you, you, a couple of things you just said about finishing well. So we've just opened a charity, yeah? Uh, and we want to develop the charity around the mental health, addictions, prisons, prisoners. And a, a lot of people out there with the with the pride mask on, they go, yeah, they're trying to earn money, what are they talking about, blah, blah, blah. But if we shift away from that uh, and we look to the people who want hope because they're criminals or they've got a needle in their arm and God bless you, I pray you make it. This sort of stuff from the insanities that we've been through, whether mine's a big drug bust or yours is in a Thai prison, it was painful, you know. Uh, and, and I think the message that we can give is hope. And our charity, we've called Finish Well, yeah. So it's about finishing well. And, and I just would like to express that no matter how big the drug story is, how many views you get, how many this you get, how many TikTok, Facebook, whatever you get, the development of this, I pray, is that the people out there suffering, who, eh, no, I'm all right, right? That when they're sitting there with a the dagger at their neck or the gun to the head or, the injury, or they want to hang themselves, please God, they don't. There's a, a book like yourself, mine, and a number of others that they can go, hold on. I could have wrote a great crown, crime book if I wanted to. Yeah, <laughs> I could have done, yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> but, I, but, but I don't kiss and tell. But, but there's an exclusive story in my criminal life that would blow your pants off. And I'm not talking trying to beef myself up. But all of it is about me getting well so I can help the next Michael or you can help the next Billy walking around the corner and they don't have to go through the pain and misery. So we become like an hospital. We become like... And we're not looking for any benefits. Well, I hope we're not because the ego can play tricks with you. But I think these big stories like your, like yours, and I'm not beefing like, like mine, I think on the, on the bear, it gives people hope. They can think whatever they like, but I guarantee a lot of people who listen to your stuff would love to say, well, I ain't wrote a book, Bill, but I'm bang in trouble. What do I do? Many people do that. Where Many do people, I yeah. go? And that's the beauty of having the influence, Bill. Do you know what, right? I, I say this, Michael. Do you know what? I, I get a few messages... And um, people DM me and, and ask questions and they've watched the podcast or they've, they've read a story and um, they've seen a movie and, and that has inspired them to, to reach out and ask for help. Terrific. Because they, they realise they're not on their own. We don't have to go to these specific places that that that, that I need to go to, yeah. you yourself need to go to, so that, that, that we don't need to mention. Um, but with social media and the platforms that we do have, we can, we can carry that message further. Mm than your local environment, Absolutely. you know, and um, I've got people sending me, and I will reply to and respond to, to each and every one, but I can't promise I'll be there, but I can always signpost people in the right direction, that's it, because to give, to, to give yourself 
surely constantly is is quite draining, oh, especially yeah. when you've got a family and a life and, and a career to kind of go down. It's quite difficult, but I can give a bit of me. Mm. And I believe that we can pass that on to someone else who can give a bit of them. Absolutely. And a bit of him and a bit of her. Yeah. And a, so everybody's giving a bit of something to someone. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, to make them whole and feel better. Yeah. You know, and that's, 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 I had a friend who passed away. He, he ended his life uh, 18 months ago. Loved the bones of him. Miss him dearly. Um, he was in recovery. He was a close, close friend. Knew him for a long, long time. And it hit me hard when he passed away. Right. Um, and he always said, you know, we can't be there all the time for someone, but we can always be there together yeah. when we can. Amen. You know, it's like it was just like it was just a little saying he had. I understand. You no, know, we can all we can all give a little bit of something. Absolutely. Because we haven't got it all to give. Absolutely. So I think it's important, and I always stress this: it's important to, you know, if people are struggling to to reach out. Mm. You know, and and mm. have faith that someone out there will. Listen to your story. Because mm-hmm. someone had faith in me, yeah. sat down mm-hmm. and listened to me, and it was like, it was mind blowing. Mm-hmm. So that, that bit of empathy. Because mm-hmm. I always thought someone wanted something from me. Mm-hmm. If you sat in front of me telling me I was a nice person, I either thought you were gay. <laughs> right? Oh, sorry. Seriously, I thought you were either gay <coughs> and that you fancied me. Yeah. Because I didn't have no awareness or right, understanding. Right. I was yeah, yeah. emotionally stunted. Mm-hmm. I, I was quite. Uh, Arrogance. Mm. I had that air of arrogance. Yeah, so I, I didn't believe that you could give me any positive affirmation and tell me I was a decent kid. Mm. You're a nice fella, you went, whoa. Yeah. Mate, I'd rather you call me something yeah. unsavory because I'm used to that. Yeah, for sure. It was it was it was unfamiliar getting told mm. uh, I was a decent kid. So I, I I really found that difficult. And that was due to having no self esteem. Do you think though with uh, sorry to put it back to you, but show your book and your film. If if the ego in people want to go, oh, he's made a film, he's made a book, that's that's cool. But the people who are crying out for help, yeah. yeah. So say me, for example, watching your film, and I, I won't go over it again, but that, that moment when you was getting that train, yeah. Now, I enjoyed the film. I haven't read your book, and I'm looking forward to it. But that came out of that screen and thought, oh, I get that. I've got that. I needed that that train moment, that that stop moment, and so many people out there who can watch that film because people like watching films and exciting films. But I hope and pray that a lot of people watching that film think, "Wow, that man's got the balls to say I, I'm tough," which you probably are. But you know what? I'm broken, mm. and I want a way out. And you put it on a big screen. So it takes it takes cojones to do that. But isn't it nice? when the people's ego gets flicked away and they go, Bill, excuse me, I, I, I don't want to drive you mad, but c- can you tell me where you got your recovery? Can you tell yeah. me how you changed? And can you, you know, and, and, and to, to then till today, from you, what you was there to what you are today, that's just encouraging. Mm. Forget the book and the film, that it works if you work it. Yeah. You know, and I've seen crime, and I must admit, your, your, your film was full of naughty crime, it was violent, it was aggressive, it was all sorts of things, it was, it was wonderful, it was sexual, it was crazy, it was manipulative, it was seductive, and all you wanted to do to say to everyone, I'm in trouble here, <laughs> not because of the dick, <laughs> yeah. I'm in here, I want to get out of that cell. So, I mean, growing up, he asked me about my criminal life. So... I was at the, there was a murder in, and, and I wouldn't be talking to you about this if, I, if it weren't documented neither, but there was a murder in a club. Uh, a man called John, he was from Chelsea, John Binden, and, and there was, well, something happened, there was an altercation and someone died. And I was 18 and I witnessed it, got in a bit of a thing myself there, uh, not, not violent, I had a little fight, my dad was there. Every face, and we won't name them, was in that club. And... Uh, that was the uh, I, I was given anyway it doesn't matter what I'd done but it was the experience of the heart the eye and the heart and it didn't frighten me and yet if a little mouse run out of that corner I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories just to abbreviate what I'm trying to express it didn't worry me when I was arrested at gunpoint it didn't worry me not because I'm a brave man because yeah I was I was up for that but so the, the, the murder or, or, or what happened there, I was there, I see it, 
I, 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 I witnessed something, whatever, I, I, allegedly, I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but I'm talking about the trauma of the emotion. And it, fit, it, it ticks the box, yeah, Brian Emmett's son, and it was all there. And, uh, uh, uh. But you know ourselves when the addiction is starting to come on us. That we're looking to be fed, whether it's drink, drugs, and don't they realise, well, I've got to look good. Oh, yeah, I was at the murder. Yeah, well, I wasn't at the murder. And I, I see it was an altercation, and it was a manslaughter, or whatever, it was an accident, or whatever it was. Um, uh, and I don't want to open up a can of worms here, but it was the emotional level. Yeah, and I lived off the prestige for a little while, but it was a little man in there went, Whew. wow, is this what you want to be? Is this where you want to go? And that drive. And then I went to prison a couple of times, and then I got at it big time. I'm talking about we was arrested at the time for the largest importation of cannabis into this country. Yeah, so what does that mean? Oh, yeah, right. But the, the irony of Michael, the mixture of an opposite, yeah, so I, 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 I've got to be, going back to that what you before you got carry on. But you know when you get a, you get arrested for the biggest drug haul in the UK, right? And you're on the landings, right? And everybody knows about it. Yeah. Do you feel that the prestige and the importance of it all, just on the external side of things, but when you're in that cell internally, <laughs> you're like you can go out there and everyone's like, oh you've done this, you've done yeah, that, you're yeah. gonna get this, you're gonna get that. And, and and you feel like a superstar mm. amongst other inmates. Correct. Right. But then that's all shuts mm. silently. Mm. You're in there on your own. Mm. There's no one's a kid. No. You can't fool anyone. No. You're sitting on that bunk. Absolutely. Right. You're going, what the fuck? <sighs> it's unbelievable. It's like, and it's always that. Don't you, you're always saying, and, and I know there's people out there, I should have done this. Yeah. I should have done that. If only. Absolutely. Right. We, we, we go back. We, we, you know, we wish we had the time machine. We could do this differently. So, was that something that affected you? Did you feel ashamed? Yeah. I'll tell yeah. you what done me. When, just prior to me getting arrested, and then I jumped straight onto that, I was in an environment in, in Morocco, yeah? And it was, whatever was going on, there was some prestige people there. There was a weapon there. There was some some London faces there. And I'm the sort of the new kid on the block. All nonsense, yeah. All I want to do is have a puff. And they're all talking about multi-million pounds um, smuggling operations. And I'm there. I'm, 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 not that my dad was anything special, but he had a bit of influence. And I'm his son. And I looked the part. I was a lot heavier than this. I was a bit fitter. And I want to, they said, no, no, you don't. And I tried to smoke. I said, eh, knock the life out of me. And I put my feet up on this sort of chair thing and a mouse run from behind the curtain. And I jumped up, <laughs> petrified, and went, and they went, what's this wrong? I said, my God, there's a mouse. And they went, what? It's who cares? <laughs> but my mate Bobby's going to me. I said, no, but Bob, there's a mouse that I've got. I'm stoned. I'm frightened. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you transfer that man, that's the broken child, they must yeah. have thought, God, who are we dealing with here? You're just <laughs> pitching fight of a mouse. So for me to admit that, yeah. yeah, four or five months later, I'm arrested with a gun to my head and I'm not giving it the big in here, but that energy, adrenaline of the addict, the man, I, I weren't frightened. And that's the truth. As soon as I switched emotions to my children, acted like a child. Yeah. Now, taking that into all consideration, that's the yin and yang of Michael. Absolutely fearless, but act absolutely fearful. Absolutely happy, absolutely unhappy. There was no equilibrium. There was no, I didn't know about boundaries. Mm. I, felt, I fought on my feet. I was excitable and I was unexcitable. I was pretty, I was ugly. I had everything going for me in the nick. So we arrived, first one I'm a bit shocked. There's 14 of us, because we smuggled it in on a, on a fishing boat. It's all fishermen and fishmongers and people from Devon, lovely fellas actually, hard working fishermen, you can't beat them. And they were genuine blokes, all kept their mouths shut, very, my mate Peter, well associate of mine, they was first class, you know, and they knew we was in trouble. We're the Londoners, so, my dad don't want no night or, my dad don't like all that it, they were, he, his name was in Reggie Cray's book he ripped the page out 
he didn't want to be known. He, he acted like an old man. This is your father? Uh, yeah, he didn't want to be this sort of, uh, this big gangster. My dad, really, for the crimes that he committed, you Google my dad, you, you, you won't find, he didn't like this. He didn't like all that stuff, mm. writing books. Now, this ain't a book about crime, it's a book about faith. It's just got crime in it. But to your question, I remember being on the landing, yeah. And you get a popular because I should have been a cat a prisoner. We were cat a we was arm, escorted armed officers everywhere we went um, on the, uh, going to court. And I mean heavy. There was a, there was a talk that they was going to bust one of the uh, international people who was with us, Frenchman. He was a lovely guy, Dennis. They was going to get him off the bus. So there was armed officers. It was crazy. It was like moving the IRA. <laughs> it really was. And and but it. We should have gone into an ACAT prison in Bristol, but they weren't ACAT prisoners, the rest of the, the other people working with us. And, I, and I, I'm still friends with a chaplain from the prison today, a lovely man called Bill. He said, I don't know how you stayed in Exeter prison. <laughs> but God had a purpose, I believe. Spiritual stuff had a purpose. And I remember standing outside my cell. I just smoked a, a skunk joint or whatever that is, stuff is. I'm, I'm out of my brain. And I'm holding court, yeah, as you do, because of the, oh, look at him, he's smuggler, he's this, his dad's there, all that nonsense. And it fixes you for a little while when I'm high. And this white geezer walks up to me, he's a lifer. I can't remember his name. But he'd done 22 years. Uh, and after two years, he got clean and sober. And this is what he said to me. And it was a turning point for me. And my life had been chaotic, <sighs> you know. And he went, Michael, there's only one person who you need to get on with in this nick. And I went, oh, <laughs> you know, as you do, all fear-based. Well, if someone down the land, you know, I ain't frightened of no one. This is what my head's saying. <laughs> yeah. And he said, there's only one person you've got to get on with. And I said, who's that? He said, it's you. He said, you must get on with yourself. And that, that was like a drill going through my head. And I sat in the cell, in the same cell as my dad, by the way. I mean, that was pretty mad. And I'm thinking, I don't get on with Michael. I don't, and it was the first start. And I'd had the Catholic stuff because of my grandmother. Listen, I always believed in God. I used to pray to get me cannabis home. If you please get this one home and I'll never do it again. So there was always that broken child and this big tough man. I didn't have an identification. I didn't know who I was. I've been very wealthy. I've been very skint. Mm. I've drove Range Rover cars. I can't afford an Oyster card. I've had beautiful houses. I've been homeless. So my addict, that 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 yin and yang of me, has taken me <laughs> to so many vocal places. Yeah. Big crimes. I thought they was joking when they nicked me, Bill. Yeah. Big gun to me, Ed. There were 60 officers there. You know, I think 16 or 14 was armed. Night sights and guys. It was like madness. It was like a, like a film set. Yeah. And in, even in that, it was like all theatrical. And I thought, what are they, what are they doing? What are they saying? This is serious for <laughs> You just didn't get it. I yeah. didn't go, you know, I didn't understand what real life was all about. Yeah. Although I had this beautiful art, my head was so crazy. No wonder my mum thought I was a schizophrenic for a little while. Not that she thought that, but she, she did question it. But mine was the spiritual malady. Mine was that addict. Mine was that the, the, the good and the bad that didn't sort of resonate. So the answer to your question, was I like that in the nick? Yeah, for a while. But then I took the faith on board. So that came with a real, what do you mean? You, you can't be a Christian. You can't have a faith. You're, you're meant to be this big tough boy, yeah? So that, th as much as there was popularity, there was also a question mark. There, there was a snigger. There, there was a ridicule. But I knew that I had to change. Not from being a criminal. Not from being anything. But I had to change because I wanted to feel at peace. I wanted to like myself. I wanted to have a conversation with myself, not based on what I could get, who I could have sex with, how much money I could earn, who I could lie to. I didn't want it no more. I didn't want the manipulation. And, and, and I still struggle today with it. But, you know, I had a, I had a drink for 22 years. And... Um, and I've done a lot of work on myself, but it's waiting there. And if it ain't in a drug, it could be it could be in anything else. So I'm I've had to lose everything to find 
the real me. Mm. And and I and I've started to like myself a bit, to be honest with you. And I've done some mad stuff. I, I I've slept with my my wife's sorry Tracy, but I slept with my wife's best friend. I I, I loved this girl. I, I went out with, and then a few years later, uh, when I come out of prison as as a faith believing man in recovery, um, I had a beautiful business with a boy, and I'm not being funny, but it's worth fortune today but that's not the issue the, the wealth of it the, the, the wealth of my love for this man he was my brother I adored him and he was a very very he's a wonderful boy and I slept with his wife yeah so I've repeated this is no excuse because I have to take responsibility yeah so I as a child I got abuse so I repeat I, I had these affairs and I repeated the behaviour that was impregnated in me as a very young man. So I became the abuser, not, not sexual abuse, but I went out with women who I shouldn't have been going out with. It was very close to home. My, my abuse was close to home. I found it exciting, living on the edge. The high of it was like incredible i'm not talking about the intimacy i'm talking about the high of the dysfunction it was such an adrenaline fix and i hated myself the following day and 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 i lost that i lost businesses but the, 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 forget about the businesses i'll take that back i lost they were loves of my life these yeah. people yeah and and it broke my heart so that was the high level of my addiction was i a dirty no good b in the, in the eyes of the world, yeah. But in the eyes of the spiritual side, no, I was a very broken man. So I pat myself on the back because I don't do that today. Does it make people, do, do I want to be popular? I was quite a popular young man. Uh, I became unpopular because of my behavior. Um, and, and, and if I go on what other people think, I'm gonna be constant behaving in a way that suits what you think about me. Don't exist no more. So I have to love myself. And I think one of the special gifts I've got, besides my faith, and I'm not religious, is the love of my grandchildren, like I said earlier. And the commitment to do what's right. If I do what's right, then I'm getting there. And I'm talking about coming from a multi-million pound lifestyle, if you want to be honest with you, to not being out to get on a bus. It was quite a dramatic change. And like I say, that's where I sort of think my rock bottom was. But there are trap doors still av available if I want to choose them. But I think it's about growth. On a, that's why I like the program, one day at a time. So I'd seen all the mad criminals. I, I'd met all the mad criminals. I've had all the mad money. Um, but for me today, one of the most one of the things that I'm very happy about, I, I began a course in prisons. It's a Christian course. And people go, oh, Christianity, whatever. That, that's, their, that's their stuff. But for me, we started a course called the Alpha Course. And it's gone around the world. It's in 900 prisons around the world. And I don't look for an ego prestige thing out of that. What I look at is thinking, wow, I, I was at the beginning of something that's done good for people. Mm. And I've seen people get saved. There was a man on death row who'd done this course. He got reprieved. Not down to me, nothing to do with me. But I was part of something organically that grew without investing money, without manipulating anybody it grew because it was the like the like the room or whatever it grew because it had spiritual growth so i've seen spiritual growth be productive mm. so why not believe in it what why not embrace it if i if, if i go to the opinion of the world i'm screwed because the opinion of the world go you're weak you're this you're that you've took this you've done that you've done that what a fool you've lost your money what you've done to your kids that's what the world want to say but if i can use that as a platform to say do you know i don't do that no more there's a chance, and you've got away with it. You say, "Be cool," you know, whatever. You know, no class to you. But I just think integrity and honesty, which I still struggle with, Bill. To be honest with you, it, it, it is the mainstay for for success in life. If I'm true to myself. Yeah, see, that that all stems. That that's brilliant. How it all stems from that that life of change here. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's only one person you need to get on with, Absolutely. and that's with Michael. And I remember like my first introduction into recovery and someone said, Bill, you only need to change one thing about yourself. And I was thinking, oh yeah, you know, what's that? You know, is it, is it my arrogance? Is it my attitude? He said, you need to change everything. Mm. And 
that for me was like oh, did he change everything and I like because I like parts of me that kept me alive I thought you know like my humour the survival you know because we go through a whole process of uh, learning about ourselves and you say well you need to remove this you need to rid yourself of that and I'm thinking what lust yeah. oh, and I, but, but, but my desire for women is quite strong you know I was young I was hot blooded you know so I, I felt okay I'll leave that for a bit you know, I was very selective in in in, um, in these rituals of that are, of life and um, greed and I could be I could be more self self selfless and help a newcomer and you know it's, it's so I was very yeah like I said I was selective in in the way I wanted see and you talked about the integrity and honesty and it's a big thing because I remember you know my first counselor saying to me you know have you got integrity and i did not know what that meant <laughs> right. right i thought what does, i get that I, what's he talking about integrity i heard words like when i first came around it was like with procrastination now i wasn't i didn't i wasn't brought up with that kind of language no, you know um and i felt i felt like less than other people mm. who were using that and i felt they were elevating themselves with fancy words mm. To make themselves important, put me down. This is no, the okay. this is the way. Well, I get yeah. that. So when I hear like integrity, and I was thinking, because my 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 uncle Freddie, right, he's still alive, and I don't know where he is. And you know, he, he helped me a lot years ago when I was in prison. He used to write me letters. I didn't know he was in recovery, right? I did not was did not know nothing about that back then. I wasn't interested. He told, no one told me about it, and he never put it on me. I just heard later on as the years went by. But he used to write letters to me, right? And um, he'd have big long words, and he'd say to me, "Find out what um, uh, what was it that he, he was talking about? He talked about uh, this this word, but which I had I had to go to the library and get a dictionary and look it up. You know, I think it was incredulous. You know, so like, what the fuck's that mean? What does it mean? It, it means like disbelieving, unbelieving. It's incredulous, and it was like great. You can pronounce. Yeah, you know, fucking, <laughs> I don't think I couldn't even read it at the time. I think I screw. But there was they used to like, write, and I used to want to find out why. And I think that's important when you want you're willing to learn, you're willing to change. You know, you're willing to to to, to extend them goals and go further than you can. Mm. You know, push those boundaries physically mm. and mentally. Yeah. To 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 improve. So when I hear, like, you need to change one thing, and it's everything, mm. do you think that's, that's a, quite a difficult task? Very, very, you know, that's why it's one day at a time, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the honesty is, you know, I'm quick to deny because I've been used to it. We're sick, of, we're as sick as our lie, aren't yeah, we? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You no, know, yeah, that's the question. No, it wasn't me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then could, name, because, yeah. because, was it me? Yeah. We were talking to lie as kids as criminals, yeah. weren't we? Well, it's, yeah, so it's, it's it's learning to adapt and, and change. But do you know what I remember, even as a, as a kid? Um, I used to have a few fights as a kid, and I weren't bad. Yeah. But I can also remember times when my bottle went. Oh, yeah. Over, the, over someone who wasn't so dominant, so powerful, but it was that mice situation. Ah, it's a mice. That no matter what day it was... I wasn't sure what Michael would turn up. I could be the most gallant sort of. And this addiction stuff, for anyone who's listening, it's very, very powerful. And it ain't only about getting clean. It's about doing the work that you just said, changing everything. And we want to change, we want to be do good as well. This is what I was like early days. No, I want to do, well today I want to do it genuinely. I would love to build an environment where we're helping kids abroad at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to promote what we're doing because it's like we're, we're doing, I like to do it privately with God, but we've got a little African family um, that we've got no money. And I know that there's pe people suffering here, uh, but I've got a heart for Kenya because I've been there, spoke in the prisons out there. And um, I've t attached myself to this little boy, had nothing, parents have both died. And, and, I, I, and he touched my heart, yeah? So we got him some chickens He's laying a few eggs, uh, and then we, uh, and this is part of the charity. A little bit of land that we that he had there, it was wasteland. We we, we sort of helped him to re, re turf it, seed it, and they're growing vegetables. Uh, and and for me, honestly, when he sends me a video of what he's doing, I go on my own and I think, 
no one knows it, and we've been doing it for a few months, so I'm not trying to say, oh, look at us, we're doing good. But they're the little things in life that I, I, I find is part of my healing. Yeah. Uh, and I think they take away the dysfunction that might just come along of, 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 of well, you know, uh, give it, make sure you build them a school or whatever. <laughs> but the, to be, being genuine and just helping this guy along the way, and plus we help people here in the UK. So we're trying to establish ourselves yeah. in, an, in an environment where we do get loads of money, yeah? We, and the reason why we want to try and earn loads of, or get loads of peace, loads of integrity, and loads of financial blessing. So we generally do want to help other people. And you need those sort of things to attach yourself to. So, sorry that I mentioned the money, but it's, it's a big thing. Because if we, act, we can give our time and we can give our love. But like the homeless thing, I, 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 the young lady you met here previously, she works big, big time in the homeless and I went along and, and worked there. And I struggled with it at first. But, it, but once I got into it, and these guys sleeping on the street, women sleeping on the street, and, 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 and I'm not trying to beef the homeless thing up because I work with a lot of prisoners as well. But when you think about the, the money that's wasted, and people go, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that for a month, and we do it for a f good fill factor as well. But I would genuinely want to use, pray God, the influence that this may bring. And it's early days for me. I'm, not, I'm new, new at this game. And I would love to be have a platform where people, not because I want everyone to know, yeah. I, but I'd like to be able to help people coming out of prison. Not me, the people around me. Showing them that they have a value. I'd love to get a working farm, actually. Yeah. And get them on the working farm. Let them know that you can be loved. The traffic women I have an art for. Yeah, um, All the addictions. And, and, and the inner city kids. These kids growing up in this inner cities who don't know no different. That, and I'm not judging the parents, but you know, have been brought up by single parents. They've seen levels of addiction of, of cannabis in these eye ride blocks, and it goes on everywhere. Is it, no, nowhere is it a class distinction. But I just think if this project could bring some clarity, some influential people like ourselves, without wanting to have big numbers and egos, and it's all right to get them, but that influence, if it's for the purpose of good, for the next Billy coming round the corner, the next Michael coming, and I'm not trying to fix the world. I don't want to be the big shot. I, I want to create. What I used to create in the world, I was quite good at creating big things. Yeah? Although I was the frightened boy. I'd like to create something big today, or however long, however long it takes, with the influence of people, because I've seen these spiritual programs grow, I have bear witness to it, where people can come sit down and really understand that what we're trying to do is give it away so we can keep clean and these people ain't got to go through what we, or maybe they have to, I don't know what their journeys are, but I, I want to substantiate that so my children's children can understand that Christmas morning, sometimes you have to get up and go to the homeless shelter and give them your present away. I'd love them to have that moralistic value view on life rather than, oh, I've got not a new pair of training shoes and I look what my kids get and what they give their kids. Christmas is a lovely morning, but I just think the influence at a very young age to be able to give away your time, your love, your compassion, because it's a broken world, Billy. Yeah, you don't have to wait till you get to our age, do you? No. Which is, um, which is sad, really. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it did make sense. It made a, a lot of sense. And um, I've loved every minute of this conversation. Me too. It's, it's kind of turned out a bit differently than what, what I expected. And that, and that's that's good because I don't say it up when I've shut and planned. I think it's, you know, I've looked at you and, and I've spoke to you this morning and you live in humble surroundings. You haven't got a massive ego. You're not... You know, you're not look. I could tell. You know, you wouldn't put your hands in your pocket going to cafe. And and I, it's uncomfortable for people because you you need. So, but it was nice. It's nice. It's nice what you do, and um, I appreciate it. Um, and we're coming to the end now, right, Michael? So, where can you get this book? 
you can I mean the COVID has restricted us doing what we're doing but yeah. I, it's it's uh, online I think is the quickest way yeah yeah Amazon uh, Waterstones all, all the big sort of people out there so you can got, get this in Waterstones and Amazon yeah but Amazon's I think where you I think yeah, that's where the, the big stock is that's the bigger platform isn't it I think really? so yeah. but I just want to say something before we close off so you can find me if you want to have a look at us we're trying to grow organically we're on Instagram on Michael Emmett Official. There's a Facebook thing. There's a TikTok thing. Oh, I don't do it. Other people do. And we're trying to create, and we get a number of people who are following us now, like me and you, Billy, who, who want a chance. And they, can you pray for my kids? Can you help my husband or whatever? But I could have given you a, 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 a crime podcast, but I was determined not to. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I've taken to you that... that one of the things on, and listen, I ain't giving blasting your ego here, but that train line thing in your film was like a message my dad used. I remember things my dad used to say to me. And I think that was so poignant. I thought, I want to meet this fella. Not because you made a film or you made a book, and I've heard nice things about you, because there was something in that drama, because I identify that pain. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you why I got the chance because it's I wrote about it in my first story and um, that moment and how it happened. Yeah, please. I'd, do. I'd come off a I'd come off a motorbike in Laos before I'd been arrested, so I'd injured my side. Uh, the, the, the motorcycle had landed on my chest, it crushed my ribs, punched my lung, it, it, it ripped my intestines wires up me. I was stitched up in Bangkok. I had operations, I had three surgical operations from a prison in Thailand, um, and. What was year was it, Bill? This was in 2006-2007. Right. Now, I'm in, um, I'm in Chiang Mai Central Prison yeah. Hospital. Well, not in the prison. It, uh, they took me from the prison to the hospital. I'm on the seventh floor. I've got shackles on my ankles. Yeah. Right, the chains weigh three kilos. Now, the nurses have wrapped bandages around them because they, they clink, 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 and it was disturbing the other, the patients. I'm put in a bed in a room with six other, six other men. They were just... They were, you know, patients who were coming to, to the hospital for whatever reason. Um, and I was the only foreigner. Now, there was one prison guard that used to come, 12 hour shifts. You'd come in, let on, walk away, and you wouldn't see him all day at all. And after a couple of days, I thought, I need a cigarette here, because I was smoking at the time. I want a cigarette. I was desperate for shiggy, you don't want to add none. So I got up, went to Sully, went down the, um, the fire exit. Seven flights of stairs. With the shackles on your feet? With the shackles on my feet. Walked down the stairs. Opens this door. Looks out. And there's, it was surreal, right? The sun was cracking the flags. There was little picnic blankets out. There was people sitting there drinking. All Thai people. Yeah. Families. You've come to the hospital to visit f f friends and family. Um, and it's just, look, you come from that prison, from the hospital to this, and you're outside, and you're seeing families just enjoying yeah. life and, uh, and doing things that I should have been doing. Yeah. Uh, and, and I took that step forward and no one looked and, and, and no one followed me. So I took another step further and then he approached me when he was smoking. Bummed a cigarette, bit of tanks, went back, smoked it, went back to me, me, me bed. No one had seen me, no one had and battered an eyelid and I thought, okay, so I'm going to do this again. And I remember uh, Catherine... So she, you went back the first time? Yeah, I went back to the room. Yeah, I, was, yeah, I went yeah. from downstairs back yeah. up to the stairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Catherine gave me some money. Now, Catherine was a missionary. She used to come to the right. prisons to see us. Yeah, she was yeah. a Christian missionary. Yeah. She looked after us. She yeah. gave us food twice yeah. a week. Yeah, yeah. Made sure we were okay. Yes. Our health and well-being. Yeah, this yeah, is the yeah. kind of people that I Lovely, was that yeah. were coming to see us. Now, I'm, I'm in my me, in me, in me room in the hospital again. She's come to visit me. And I... It's for a thousand baht, which is about twenty odd pounds at the time. Yeah. So I said I just need it to buy food when they come round because they, they used to come round and buy sell bits of baskets of fruit and stuff. So I said, give us that so I can get a bit of fruit. Are you okay. still in the hospital? Now? I'm still in the hospital. No, right. I'm in the hospital for a week, right? right. Ten days. Um, this is about the fourth day, and I'm just had me, I had me shirt, my operation the day, the day right. after I got there. So I'm just there recovering mm. and getting looked after. I've got a big bandage on my side here, by the way. Mm. Right, these shackles. Um, I'm about 30, 33 I am. I'm quite, quite young. I'm younger than I am now. Um, so I've made this... I'm, I'm, I'm an addict as well. I'm in a grip of addiction here. You know, I'm on, I'm on all kinds of drugs. And I knew that in Thailand, 
the chemist sold tramadol tablets, yeah. right? Over the counter and diazy pans and everything. And I remember going down the stairs again, outside, I had this thousand baht, it was daytime. So I took a step forward and I marched over. Because you could see the shops, the 7 Eleven, the chemist. I was going to the 7 Eleven to buy cigarettes Still with this with money. The shackles. With the shackles. But I had a sarong on. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah. sarong covered yeah, yeah, the shackles, yeah, yeah, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the sarong on, covering the shackles, and I was doing baby steps. Yeah, yeah. My focus was on the 7 Eleven. I was going to get a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. This is me, me plan. Yeah. Bottle of whiskey, a little bottle of whiskey. 20 crunk six cigarettes, cigarettes they were called. Bypassed the um, the 7 Eleven. The chemist was next door. Walked in and bought 500 Tramadol or 1,000 Tramadol tablets for, for like 450 baht. Went back, got some cigarettes, got a little bit of whiskey. And I drank them, taking the tablets, smoking. Just, just doing what I could. Just ended up speeding off these tablets anyway. So outside still. Yeah, it was just you no. Know, this is I'm in the room now. Oh, okay. Just, yeah, but I'm smoking the cigarettes outside. I'm just up and down now. I'm freely going up and down yeah, now. Yeah, no one's seeing me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so You're no one's no one's even yeah. I'm comfortable yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. No one's questioning anything. So I, I feel like I'm just going up yeah. right now. I'm just going down, but yeah. no one's saying nothing. It was two in the morning. The tablets are finished. So. I'm lying there thinking I've got them going. I'm making. A, I'm going to make a break for it. And this is. It was in the movie. Um, so I've come down the back steps. Two o'clock in the morning. Open the exit door. Gone out. No one's out there. Obviously it's pitch black. Goes across the grass. Climbs over this chain link fence. Wow. Now, I'm in the streets of Chiang Mai. Yeah. Right. And I'm walking down these alleys. Yeah. Towards the railway track. And what's going through my mind, Michael was. I've got shackles on. I've just been sentenced to three years. It's not a long time, considering. Where am I going to go? You know, what's going to happen? You know. Did you know anyone there? I knew no one. I thought I'm going to get crashed up, either shot. I'll end up going back to prison and getting a 25 year. Yeah, no, I get it. So there was a lot of stuff yeah, going yeah, through my sure, mind. Yeah. But I, carried, I was walking forward and I was just like, surrender. That's what coming to me. Amen, yeah, surrender it. from the heart. And I remember. Just thinking, go back. Yeah. Go back. There's not there's not there's not on forward for you here. Mm. You know, you need to face yeah, reality, face the consequences, yeah. deal with it. Mm. I went back and and, I, and and you know what? Sometimes I think to myself when I was there, why did I go back? Because I suffered a hell of a lot. Mm. I, I experienced and, and, and I know you did. Observed loads of murders, rapes. It, you know, know, it was it was horrendous. Because it was only at the beginning of that sentence. Mm. And it was three years, and three years is a long time. Absolutely. It's a long time, it's especially, you know, in, in a foreign country. So I went back, and, you know, sometimes I keep myself, I said, I should have went, I should have done, but now, on reflection, it was the best. It saved your life. It saved my life. Yeah. So I hope that's cleared a few yeah, yeah. moments for you. I mean, the film is, is adapted from my life story. There's 90% of the, the film is accurate because I worked alongside John Stefan, who's a great, great director, and... You know the screenwriter Nick Hirsch being mm. we we sat down and we and we went through this mm. you know together and there was a few things that he wanted to put in for drama and great scenes. you know uh, yeah great it was just great it's just a great great so story. that bit when you had the fight in the ring you was injured weren't you yeah was that true that was true so what they did because I was told I couldn't <laughs> fight no more because that's of all, injuries because of injuries and they blamed it on me addiction which it was because. If he hadn't been used, I wouldn't have crashed that motorbike oh, because yeah. I was looking. I was I was using opium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was buying opium in in Lao and, and Yabba yeah, yeah. tablets and, and a couple of people whistles, wolf whistles, and yeah. I looked and I, I was on the wrong side of the road and these two taxis were coming forward at me and they ate me and it, it was it was horrendous. I was rushed to be alive. I was I rushed I was rushed to an hospital in Lao. It was five miles away by this Irish kid on a wheelbarrow yeah. and the wheelbarrow was just full, it was gushing, swishing. Full wow. of blood. Wow. Uh, I've got a hole, and people who know me, I've got uh, me, half of my my stomach's being ripped apart um, through this. I couldn't breathe. I remember these two. But this is your podcast now. I oh, remember no, these. No, I remember no. these two. Um, these two soldiers walking in with AK forty sevens, and he had them banana clips. It was yeah. quite, and then he had tape around. It was one of those double ones, you know, where clinics across the way. Um, and he just looked at me, one pulled out a camera and took a picture and I thought that was quite odd. Yeah. But I had a, a load of tablets, yeah, methamphetamine tablets in my pocket. 
And my f- focus, my thinking was like, I hope they don't find the drugs. I'm fucking dying, by the way. Right, right. My next thinking was like, typical, isn't it? they've gone. Where can I go and use? Right. Yeah. I can't even breathe. Yeah. <laughs> but my, 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 the most important thing to me you is, I want to get high. Change the way I feel. Change the way I feel, right. It, the day, oh, and, and, and <gasps> I've got a breath because I've got sands onto my side and I must have, must have moved the rib and boom, you know, <sighs> me, me lung fill full of air. I said to this Irish kid, look, get, get me out of here right now. He said, oh my God. He said, I thought you were Russian. He said, that Russian look. He said, I didn't know where you were from. Yeah. He, he took me in a taxi and I, straight away, I was, gone, I was gone. They could not do nothing for me in love. It was like I was on a floor on a mattress with a doctor with a dirty white coat on, right, with a clipboard saying he was going to die. That's all I heard, right? And then um, I thought, fuck this, and, uh, get me out of here. Going back to, he took me back to his house. I'm in his I was smoking the Abbott tablets in the in the bathroom, right? Um, in the morning, he takes me to the border. I get on a bus, tang my I'm in bits now, Michael. I'm black and blue, you know, it's all starting to come out bruises. And so, <gasps> some girl, some Thai girl, quite friendly of my, quite friendly with me. She came and met me at, at uh, Chiang Rai. And we went to Chiang Mai uh, Hospital. And I stayed there for three months. Before I went into to uh, before I went into the streets and even created more consequences, getting arrested. And that boxing scene was like, you know, all I had left in me whilst I was there was the fight, yeah. the fight to survive, the yeah, fight to live, sure. the fight to the fight to go forward. You take that away from me, and I was going to tie. No, okay. And um, the, even the trainer, the, the boxing, the the John, he knew that, and um, just 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 allowed me to continue. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like. A great decision. It wasn't the best decision, but it was mine. Yeah. Uh, I'm here today to, to talk to you about it. But yeah, so I, I didn't mean to go on there, Michael. No, to be it. honest, and I, and I know it's people. No, might, leave it. I, I, yeah. I, I don't cut that out. It's fantastic. So, but what I do say is, that at the end of every podcast, is um, any pearls of wisdom. So, what would you, right, say to a young Michael Emmy coming through the doors of life? Before we finish, I'll tell you what I would say: is is uh, establish what your truths are. There's there, there's there's the ego, there's the pride, which the world sort of wants to sort of talk to us about. But I think the key to everything, yeah, is not the love of a woman, or the love of lust, or or, or the love of your children, maybe, or the love of life. The most important thing for anyone is to love ourselves, not by what trainers we're wearing on, or we've got on, or what shoes, or clothes, or or, or, or do we look good for our friends, which is part of growing up. But I think if we will learn to be kind to ourselves, by what by, by sleeping well, by training well, by speaking well, by being kind, like the Bible says, love thy neighbour. So I think if we learn to love ourselves, uh, uh, and believe that we are something. We, we, you know, we're designed perfectly. Each of us are. We have a purpose, I believe, in this life. Because if the purpose is earn money, have kids, when you get to 50 or 60, you think, well, hold on a minute, what was all that about? Because nothing exists. Mm. The, the, all that materialistic things. But I think to love ourselves gives us humility. It gives us hope. And if we can love ourselves, it enables us to love other people. And I think that that's... And if you're struggling, the word surrender seems to be weak. The word surrender is strong. They don't like the word God. I'm not sure what you think of all that. But let's come away from that. Let's think about the, the air that we breathe. You know, we spin around in space. We take it all for granted. You know, it's night time in Australia at the moment. No one's got a light switch on. It's a miracle. We're, we're miracles. And I think if we take from life something kind so we can give something back in anyone struggling be good at sport be good at what you like but the most important thing i think is to learn to love ourselves brilliant thank you brilliant. thank I, you i loved it thank you i loved it and thank with, you with that michael bless you bless you thanks for inviting me anytime had a great time thanks bill bless you